you turn with me to the book of Philippians chapter 3 verse 12 also I have see a lot of my friends pastor friends in the house and before I get the name calling I'll just wave at everybody because definitely going to miss somebody but uh, thank you to the group of men here and I am really fond of the Florida district and very humble that you've uh, allowed me to come and I do thank you for that appreciate it Philippians chapter 3 verse 12 as not as though <clears throat> I had already attained either were already perfect but I follow after it I follow after if that, if that might uh, apprehend that for which also I am apprehended of Christ Jesus. Brethren, I count not myself to have apprehended, but this one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind and reaching forth unto the things which are before. I press toward the mark for the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. Amen. So I just, I want to talk to you tonight just for a little while on the call of a man. The call of a man. I mean, it's going to help me preach for just a little bit. Amen. You may be seated great worship and praise and <clears throat> we're thankful for that God <clears throat> beyond my thoughts or imagination has since the time that he created man has been involved in man not only that he has allowed man to be a part of his master plan if you're going to see a miracle, you will never see one where there is not a man. I knew that was going to get silence from you, but it's true anyway. Man has to be involved for miracles, signs, and wonders to happen. God has just did it that way. Now, he can do it all by himself, but he has chosen that you and I be a part of of his divine plan. I don't know. I think he rolled the dice on that one sometimes. But he's still here working with us. And so oftentimes I wonder what I would have felt like if I was Noah. Just kind of out doing my thing and all of a sudden God speaks. And I've never heard God before. And he just talks to me about building a boat that I've never seen before and about rain that I never felt before and about the end of the world that I never endured before. Now, maybe you just would have been like, yeah, God, I don't know what you're saying. Not me. I'm going like, what? Who? Me? I don't think so. But even as the end of the world was coming that they know and then God looked for a man I come to tell you tonight in the Florida district God is still looking for some men amen I think he's found a group of us but he's still looking for some more men and I don't know maybe it's just my weird way of thinking, but what about this? You know, God calls Tara. He goes to Haran. He spent 10 years there, and he died. And then he goes and calls his son, Abram, and then Isaac, and then Jacob. What I'm trying to get you to understand that God is always calling men. Now, God is not a chauvinist. He's not a sexist. I'm not saying that God cannot call women. What I am saying, though, it seems predominantly that God is always 
and always has been and always will be looking for a man. And he wants to involve man in his plan. Now, I don't know about you, but, you know, can you imagine Moses? He's been on the backside of the desert for 40 years, and here at his 40th anniversary of eating dust for 40 years, he walks by a bush that's already been common, but this time a voice comes out of the bush. Now, I don't know about y'all, maybe that's common in your world. And, and he is there, and this bush is on fire, but it's not being consumed. And there's a voice coming out of the bush. God would have had to track me down because I would have been on the other side, never hearing God's voice before. I'm trying to get you to understand that God will just come into your world unannounced. He doesn't knock on your door. He just steps in and says, hey. I've been looking for you a long time. I come to talk to some men today. You might think you missed it, but you have not missed it. God is still looking to call men for his purpose and his plan. Somebody shout amen. They say that if you are a jarhead, if you are in the Marines, that Marine, being a Marine, is a calling. They say that if you're on a SWAT team, that being a member of a SWAT team is a calling. But I tell you, if you've been baptized in Jesus' name and you've been filled with the Holy Ghost, it is the highest calling. I need some men to understand. You have got a hold of the highest call that there is. So Paul says, I press toward the mark of the high call. Now, I know in your mind you think that Paul is talking about his apostleship. He is not. I know you think that Paul is referring to all the miracles. No, he is simply saying this. Every day I'm pressing to become more like Jesus. We can go back and look at it again. I press toward the mark of the high calling of God in, you need to hear what I'm saying. He's not talking about being a preacher. He's not talking about being a missionary. He's not talking about being an evangelist. He's not talking about being an apostle. He's talking about I've been called to become a son of God. a child of God, a man of God. I come to the Florida district to challenge every male in this house to rise up and take a hold of the call and let the devil know I am a man of God. No, I do know. Amen. I do know that the distinction of the man of God is usually just singling it out to preachers and pastors. But I come to talk to you tonight that it is broader than that. It is bigger than that. It is greater than that. For in my estimation, in my never-to-be-thought humble opinion, that every man under the sound of my voice or to get it into your cranium that I am a man of God. Now you need to listen to me. Not that I am a preacher. That's not what I'm preaching to you. Not that I am a prophet. Not that I am an apostle. Not, no, no, no. But the fact of the matter remains that I do have the Holy Ghost. That I have been baptized in Jesus' name that I am in covenant with God. And by virtue of that, I am called of God. And by virtue of that calling, I am standing today and rising today to my position of being a man of God. Are y'all just, are they understanding yet? 
I'm trying to preach to you that our men have been silent too long. That you are just, you, you, you know what, you're, you're happy just sitting there thinking, let the preacher be the man of God. But I'm preaching to you that every pastor, every pastor needs some men that understand the pastor is not the only one that needs to be praying. The pastor is not the only one that needs to be fasting. The pastor is not the only one that needs to be on outreach. The pastor is not the only one that be, need to be shouting and dancing and giving and holding and pulling. Are you hearing what I'm saying? But every man, every man, every man should be a man of God. When Paul was in that storm and they ran aground, the Bible says they wrapped the ship in steel girders to keep it, to keep it from falling apart, and they called them helps. When Paul is talking about those things that God put in the church, if you read, he starts talking about miracles and apostles, then he goes on down and says, government and then he says one word helps every pastor every church every district every section needs some help men that will wrap themselves around the church and says pastor don't worry I'm helping you hold it you ain't doing this all by yourself I'm going to help you hold this thing together you're not going to be on your knees by yourself you're going to have some men of God in the prayer room am I doing alright is this I come to Florida to the great district of Florida as a recruiter they said, I'm looking for an army, not a one-man army, but an army of men who's going to take their rightful place and go back home to your home church and let your pastor know, I've not been in, but I'm, I'm, I'm full in now. You don't have to worry about me. I'm going to be in the prayer room. I'm going to be here on Sunday morning. I'm going to be here on Sunday evening. I'm going to be here in the midweek service. I need somebody to help me preach up in here. My job is not the most important thing in my life. My walk with God, my church, my wife, my family. Paul said, I haven't got there yet, but I'm pressing. Everything in my life is funneling to the fact that I am a man of God. Everything that I do, the way I carry myself, my conversation is exemplifying my calling. I wish somebody help me preach right now. If you don't think you've been called, how do you think you got here? You didn't just wake up one morning and start thinking, I need to serve God. No, God came looking for you. God came knocking on the door of your heart. God came and got down in your head and started shaking. You weren't thinking about God. You were like me. You were strung out on drugs. You were toe up from the flow up and could not get up. And then God came to your heart. God came to your house. God came to your mind. God just said, I want you to join me. I got a plan. I've got a plan and a purpose for your life. Things will change when you realize you have a calling to be a man of God. Things will change the way you carry yourself at work. you start walking like a man of God. You'll start acting like a man of God. Your wife will say, is there something wrong with you? I'm the man of God. Our wives need to see men of God that are not afraid to pray, not afraid to dance, 
not afraid to shout, not afraid to give. I, I wish I had somebody help me now. Your wife needs to see a man of God say, come on, girl, get ready to go. Or you're going to make me late for the prayer meeting. It's about time we take prayer in the lead. It's a shame before God when your wife prays more than you. I ain't going to get no help, but you know what I mean? Okay. It's time we get in the prayer room and tell them women, listen here. You've been doing, good, you've been doing a good job, but we're going to do a greater job. Now, things happen when women pray. Don't get me wrong. But greater things happen when a man starts stirring around in the prayer room. You need to hear what I'm preaching to you right now. I said greater things happen when a man starts stirring around in the prayer room. When a man gets sick and tired of being sick and tired, and say, I can't have it in this no room. No, no, my children are not going to be lost. My wife is not going to be depressed any longer. I will not live with this situation anymore. I will rise up. I will build my altar. I will. Some of you look at me like you don't know what I'm talking about. It seemed, you could be seated, it seemed like an ordinary day, but it was not. Samuel knocked on the door. Jesse answered. Started with the oldest boy and got down and nobody left. Comes to the kid out there running around with the sheep. Comes with this horn of oil and pours it on the man David's head. They all knew what it meant, but everybody kept silent because they didn't want to die. The Bible says, from that moment, the spirit of the Lord came in upon him. He slew a bear and he slew a lion. You know the story. Now, he finds his formidable foe, Goliath of Gath. And he hears him just talking trash. That's what we were saying in the, in the project. He talking trash. Selling tickets that he can't pay for. See, some of y'all know what I'm saying. You know what I mean? Don't make, me, don't make me come down there where you is. You know what I'm saying? Don't make me break it down like a shotgun, dog. You know what I'm saying? David understands there's a calling on my life and there is an anointing on my life. Now you need to hold on. Because not only are you a man of God by call, but every man that's in this building needs to recognize one thing. If you do not have an anointing on your life, you need to go get one. Y'all just look at me like I'm crazy. No, 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 no. No, no. Anointing is just not for some folks. If you are a man of God, you need an anointing on your life. Now, I'm going to make some of y'all mad or crazy or just understand, but friend, if you are a bus driver for the church, you ought to be anointed. If you are a Sunday school teacher, you ought to be anointed. If you greet at the door, you ought to be an anointed greeter. If you usher, you ought to be an Oh, you're not helping me. You see, we want to let this stuff be just particular to the ministry. This is not the way God planned it. God wants all of the men anointed. He wants all of I hope I'm doing all right. I might be stirring up trouble. So when you look at the tabernacle and you look at the temple, everything inside was anointed. Not one thing, everything that was used was anointed. And when the queen of the south came to Solomon, the temple did not impress her. She liked it, but what caused her to lose her spirit on the inside, she said, and when I saw your servant, when I saw the men, how 
they kept the door, how they ushered, how they greeted, how they were happy. He said the half has never yet been told. We need some men to get to church early with a smile on your face. Get in the prayer room. We need some men that when the music start playing, you start dancing. Why? Hold on, hold on, hold on. I know you don't understand. Listen, why do we do that? Here's why. The Bible says we should enter into his with why? That's your problem. You don't even know why you're doing what you're doing. That looks crazy. It looks dumb. It looks, you know. Well, pastor, that's just a bunch of physical moving around. And I'm a word man. Well, the word says, let everything that hath breath. Don't just pick and choose the word you want. The word says let everything that hath breath. But that's not the reason either. The reason is gates are synonymous with policy. The policies of, of cities were determined within the gates of the city. Mordecai sat in the gate. That's why Haman wanted him killed. Boaz sat in the gate and now is in the lineage of David. What happens is, is Jacob now has some little stones at Bethel and he goes to sleep and he sees angels going up and down this ladder. And when he wakes up, he says, oh, my God, this is the gate. This is none other than the gates of heaven and the house of God. In other words, Jacob realized when, I, when I'm in here, angel. Maybe y'all don't need, maybe y'all don't believe in angels in Florida, but we do in California. And when you begin to worship, angels start moving inside. I know you don't believe this, but you, honey, fat meat is still greasy and many don't burn chicken. You hear what I'm saying? When you begin to worship, it looks like physical exercise, but angels begin to move and policies begin to change. Oh, you need to hear what I'm saying. And what the devil means for evil, God can turn it. I wonder what would happen to your children if you just went crazy one time and just started dancing like you had lost your mind. I wonder what would happen in your home if you start changing some things that hell is trying to pour into your house and you realize, wait a minute, while I'm dancing, angels are moving. While I'm... And so... David sees the Philistine and, you know, he has this conversation with Saul, the king. Now Saul tries to get on the gravy train, put on my armor so I can have a little bit of, you know, if he really hit it, you know, hey. If you don't, I said, well, I'll try to help the boy, you know, so I gave him my armor. I can't help him. He got killed this time. But David said, no, I don't need that. And so when he goes up, he sees Goliath, and he understands he is from the Gath family, Goliath of Gath. And in his mind, he goes like, wow, that's pretty cool. He don't even know he's dead. It's a dead man talking. It's a dead man walking and talking. Why would he say that? Because David had knowledge that Eli and his sons lost the Ark of the Covenant. And Ichabod came to the people of God. And they took that ark to Eshdog and put it in the house of Dagon. 
Now, that wouldn't mean anything until you understand that Dagon is the god of Goliath. You, you need to hear what I'm preaching. Go ahead and read that Bible. It ain't going to hurt you at all. Read that Bible. Read that Bible, baby. Read that Bible. And when they put the Ark of the Covenant that symbolizes the presence and power of Jehovah, Dagon fell down. Call 911 say, help, I'm falling down and I can't get up. So they picked Dagon up and put him back on the throne. David is saying, man, I don't need no God that I got to pick up. If you ain't serving Jesus, you ain't serving the right God. You know what I'm talking. So they come back the next day, and Dagon has fallen down. But this time his hands are severed and his head, which means his authority is gone, his dominion is gone, his ability to do anything in God. And then God says, okay, you down, stay down. So when David saw, he said, well, you coming at me in the name of Dagon, he's already been whipped. I come to you in the God that beat your God. You're not hearing me. And watch what he says. Who is this uncircumcised Philistine? Now, he's not being nasty. He's not being condescending. He's asking. Who is this guy talking all of this smack? I see some folks are from the project. Other of y'all live in the real world. He says, what do you, he's talking smack to me. He don't even know. I'm in covenant. I'm circumcised. And I'm in covenant with God. And you're there and you don't have a covenant. You don't even have a God that's big enough to take care of itself. And you talking smack to me. No, I ain't going down. You didn't hear what I just said. I'm not going down. Friend, can I tell you the devil ain't as big as you think he is? And you should be in covenant because when you were baptized in Jesus' name, uh, it was a circumcision of the heart by the Spirit, and you got more power than what you think you have. Uh, I wish somebody help me now. And you are greater than who you think you are, and you can do more than what you can think you can do. You need to step out of that island and plant your feet down, and say, I am the man that God has called me to be. You know the end of that story. I want you to know that Paul writes and says, for whom he did foreknow. Jeremiah got the address to him, and he says, look here, Jerry, I just want you to know something. I knew you before. I knew you before. You were in, I called you before your mom and daddy ever went on a date. I called you and ordained you. I picked you out from the foundation of, you're not helping me preach. You're not here by accident. You just didn't show up by coincidence. God knew you. He foreknow, he knew you before you knew you. Your life is not going crazy. God is in control. The devil can't do any more than you let him do. You need to tell him, look at here, Bubba. God knew me before I even knew me. God is on my side. And Paul says, for whom he did call. And he sums it up by saying this. What shall we say to all these things? If God is for then who is it that can be against me? You need to step out and open your mouth. 
and you need to make some declarations tonight and say, from this night on, I'm changing. I'm not going to be the old man I used to be. This night, I'm going to get an anointing. This night, I'm going to answer my call. This night. And again, I, I, to qualify, I'm not talking about a calling to preach or calling to go out and evangelize. That's, that's, our problem is we think that's the only call that there is. There are other things that you can be called to. Every church needs good men. Good men. I said, good men. Pastor don't need men that's going to argue about everything. He needs good men. This district needs good men. Faithful men. Anointed men. Call men. Paul was fascinated. He said, if God is for me, it doesn't matter who it is that's against me. He told Timothy, he says, God saved us and called us with the holy call. And, and, he, and he said, according to our works, not according to our works, but according to his own purpose, which is given in, in Christ Jesus before the world begins. I, I, I want you to understand something. That even before you knew who you were, God knew who you were. And we talk a lot about having faith in God. But have you ever thought of how much faith God puts in you? You see, everything runs two ways. Yes, we have to have faith in God. For we know without faith, it's impossible to please God. But have you ever thought how much faith God has already put in you that you would wake up and rise up and get up and move up to his purpose and his plan and why the first reason that he called you anyway. Why do you think God's investing in us tonight? Why do you think God wants to move in us tonight? He is trying to save a lost and dying world, and he know he needs more than one man to do that. Your pastor cannot reach his city by himself. He needs some good men who are anointed and called and understand their place and their purpose in the kingdom of God. Can somebody shout amen? amen. Not only that, some of you young men, I see a lot of young men here. That's cool. I like, I like that. And, and the young men, I want you to know that you are not the church of tomorrow. You are actually the church of today. And David was around 15 or 16 or 17 years old when God began to deal with him. You are not too young to answer. Say, God, if you can use anything... I know you can use me. I may be young now. You need to tell the devil, I may be young now, but I am going to grow up. Somebody ought to shout amen. I may be young now, but I am going to grow up. And when I do, I'm going to be young. Why do you think the devil fights you? That's why the, the preacher says, uh, it is good that you serve the Lord in your youth before the evil days come. Listen to me. There is no greater life than this life. There is no greater calling than this call. Some of you don't believe that. Some of y'all don't even believe fat meat greasy. You don't even know what that means, but just stick around. You need to understand something. Being called of God. Somebody give me some music on the 
on the piano? Who's going who's gonna to play? Piano. Listen. The call of God. This, I really believe this. Is greater than the call of a mayor or a city councilman or a senator or a congressman or a judge. Can I go any further? Your call that God has on your life is greater than that of being the president of the United States of America. Why? Because you traffic. Listen, we move not only in this world, but we move in that supernatural realm where policies are changed. And things are accomplished that cannot be accomplished in Washington, D.C. You want to change your world? Get on your knees. You want to change your church? You want to change your, your environment? You want to change your city? You start storming heaven. You start saying, God, you promise that if my people who are called by my name shall humble themselves and pray. No, 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 whoa, 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 before you come, before you come, stand, I want you to stand up, stand, 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 stand. Stand, stand. Let me, let me close this. Listen to me. Jesus was called and he was anointed. Thought came across my mind. That it, I've had buddies that wants me to, they want me to go to Israel. I've been kind of resistant because you know, I don't really think there's any black Jews left. I don't know if there was any to start with. That's probably something. But so I thought, if I could get a relic from the days of Jesus, the way that I thought, what would I want? The seamless ephod that he wore? That'd be pretty cool. The, tali the, the, the prayer shawl that he wrapped himself in and rocked and prayed? Brother had a ball, that'd be cool. Maybe the purple robe that Herod put around him? And, that'd be cool. Maybe the, the sandals that he wore for the time until he was crucified? That'd be all that'd be and then I thought of one other garment that was perhaps the greatest garment that Jesus ever put on that nobody recognized and nobody wanted. And so when I looked at it and I thought about it, I was like, what? what are you? I'm telling the Lord, what are you thinking about? And so I went to the upper room. And there, Brother Wells, in the upper room, he put all the servants out and closed the door. And then he went to sit down. It was the final exam. He'd already said a little child and said, if you want to be the greatest in the kingdom, you got to come like this little child. He already gave him the test and gave him all the material and they failed the test. But when they all sat down and and nobody picked the garment up. He was waiting because they had been talking about who's the greatest and who's going to do this and who's going to do that. Sounds like my church. I don't know about yours. Everybody fighting over position but missing the posture. And all of a sudden, after death and silence, Jesus rises. 
and picks up a towel and girds himself. Now they're, they're understanding I missed the test. Now everybody wants to grab the towel, pull the towel off and go, no, it's too late. What are you talking about, Pastor? I'm talking about the greatest man amongst us is only as great as his ability to gird himself with the towel of service. If you can't wear the towel, you'll never be as great as God wants you to be. Greatness is not the pulpit. Greatness is not your name on some document from St. Louis. Greatness is not your name and lights. Greatness is, as a man of God, anointed of God, and called of God, can you serve? In any capacity, anywhere, any day, any time, can you serve? Because if you can serve, greatness is upon you. Does anybody want to be great? Anybody not afraid to gird yourself with a towel and say, God, whatever you want me to do, say, Pastor, whatever you want me to do, whatever needs to be done in the church. Feel the Holy Ghost trying to move. Can I just say this? It is completely masculine to cry and weep before the Lord. It's completely masculine. There's nothing feminine about it. There's nothing that there's nothing sissy about it. So why don't you lift your hands? 